What, what I'm going to try and do is to bring this um, talk up on my screen, which will unfortunately obscure all your faces uh, while I'm speaking, uh, including mine. But I hope that won't mean that my presentation goes awry. I hope, hope not. Um, so let me start. The um, subject of human enhancement, uh, as it's called, has been uh, gaining a lot of attention, especially uh, since the millennium, I think uh, particularly in the last five years. Many book length treatments have come out by people like Michael Sandel. Um, Fukuyama has written a book, uh, Nick Bostrom, uh, Jürgen Habermas, many people have shown great interest uh, in this debate. I want to uh, go through a series of four arguments um, for the impermissibility of human enhancement. I'm going to call them the arguments from autonomy, from dignity, from inequality, and from mastery. And I'm going to argue that none of those four arguments is probative. At most, what they show is that we should act prudently and ensure that there is careful oversight, uh, institutional oversight of any program of human enhancement. But I'm also gonna argue that there's a fifth argument, which I think is convincing. Um, it's not as such a moral argument, it's a formal argument, an argument I'm gonna call from incoherence. And the basic idea behind the argument from incoherence is that in order to specify an enhancement, in a particular uh, organism, you need to grasp the nature of that organism. Um, and unfortunately, the Human Enhancement Project either denies that um, or it tends to even reject the very idea of human nature. And I think that's a, a problem. So um, I take it everybody can hear me and that it, the screen's okay and I can, I can carry on. Okay, so um, what about the first argument, the argument from autonomy? Well, this has been um, put forward, I think, quite in an articulate fashion by Jürgen Habermas. Um, he argues that human enhancement compromises legitimate freedoms since it imposes genetic changes on next uh, the next generation without their consent so there's an inescapable uh, aspect of heteronomy to this project he even calls it a project of enslavement to previous generations to the manipulation of those generations um, he calls the um, program one of um, sorry the, the project one of programming uh, future generations, and thereby affording them no fresh start, as he puts it, in life, because the start that people are given has been determined by others, those, that is, those who preceded them. Now, Habermas uh, adds his own particular concerns, as you might expect. Um, he thinks this deepens his argument, so he argues that consumer capitalism, as he calls it, is likely to reduce freedom still further because it will ensure a kind of homogeneity to the genetic choices that we make for people and thereby uh, make us victims of fashion, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that that um, is necessary for his argument. It might, it might reinforce it, uh, it might not, um, but the argument stands uh, whether or not you take that view about consumer capitalism. I, I think we can put that to one side. It's not essential. The point about self-constitution is the fundamental one. Um, those who are genetically programmed, as Habermas puts it, are not properly self-constituting. They're being constituted by 
others? Well, I think uh, two basic um, responses to this. First of all, it's unclear that genetic changes need um, institute the kind of host, wholesale changes in uh, bodily capacity that Habermas outlines. Um, Savalescu has argued that at most what we'll see is um, a change in people's predispositions um, to action and feeling. But those kind of changes to uh, predisposition are no more or less than we see at the moment with moral training, the kind of moral training that we give to the young. So we shouldn't fear uh, human enha genetic enhancement uh, along that dimension, because it's not uh, robbing us of, the kind, uh, of, of autonomy in the kind of systematic way and the fundamental way that Habermas makes out. But I think more pertinently, the more pertinent objection is that the kind of autonomy that Habermas is talking about has never really existed. So the idea of having a fresh start, as he calls it, in life has always been severely compromised, uh, partly by people's own genetic inheritance from their parents, uh, by the very upbringing they're given over which they have no control, uh, the accidents of their culture uh, and the intentions of their parents. So I think that the uh, argument from autonomy is strongly exaggerated in Harbour Mass. Um, and if there are threats, genuine uh, systematic threats to people's agency, um, those can be coped with through the law, through outlawing certain forms of enhancement. Um, uh, and more generally by kind of careful monitoring of the content of those enhancements. So I think, I think there's strong exaggeration in Habermas's argument. Um, the second argument is the argument from dignity. Now this argument um, in some people's uh, mouths collapses into the previous argument. Uh, I think Habermas is a case of this. So he uh, indexes um, dignity to autonomy. He thinks that dignity is largely at least a function of autonomy. So that if we um, uh, really inspect the, the grounds of dignity, if you like, we'll see that it uh, rests on autonomy. And I don't think that's a very interesting view of dignity because we, in effect, just have a collapse into the previous argument. What we want is a conception of dignity, which is distinct, uh, that we can get to grips with. Um, other people have argued that dignity is um, threatened by the project of human enhancement because it threatens the dignity of the disabled in particular. That is, um, it seeks to eradicate or at least mitigate certain disabilities, and that's a, uh, an unacceptable uh, threat to the dignity of the disabled. We disvalue disability, and thereby we disvalue the dignity of the disabled person, him or herself. I think that's not a very strong argument. Uh, I'll come back to it later on. It, it seems to have certain weight to it. Um, I'll go into that later, but I think that one could argue um, quite plausibly that human enhancement has the capacity to enhance dignity rather than threaten dignity, depending on how it's carried out. And the inference from disvaluing a disability to disvaluing the disabled is uh, a questionable one. I don't think it has to. Uh, follow. So that argument um, from dignity, I think, is, is relatively weak. There are others, however, in, in, in the ballpark. So uh, Patrick Lee and Robert George have argued that uh, human genetic research uh, usually targets embryos. Um, and this is, as it were, 
uh, impermissible, not in virtue of any consequences of that research, but the very um, fact of that research going ahead at all is questionable uh, and they think impermissible. Why so? Well, because they identify the human embryo with a uh, human being. That is, they think an embryo is a human being. So to experiment on it, to research it, is to uh, attack human dignity at its root, at the very first stages of human life. Well, that would go through, I take it, I think that argument's quite powerful, if you assume the metaphysical claim that the embryo is a human. Now that's highly contested. Um, not only is it highly contested, but there, is many, uh, there are many forms of research, uh, genetic research which aren't embryo based. So I suggest that this argument from dignity is relatively contentious and requires a broader grounding than Lee and George supply. So I want to um, focus on the last argument for dignity, the last form of the argument, which is put forward again by Habermas. Habermas argues that genetic engineering, as he calls it, blurs a categorical distinction between, on the one hand, the grown, and on the other hand, the made, as he calls it. That is between what we might call the natural and the artifactual. We are treating our own species as a subject of manufacture, if you like. Uh, and that undermines what he calls the ethical self-understanding of the species. We're treating human life as constructed and that is to impugn its dignity. I think this argument sounds very plausible initially because it draws on a very deeply rooted contrast between the natural and the artifactual. And that goes back all the way to the Greeks. I could talk a lot about that. Um, but this idea that um, the natural and the artifactual are deeply uh, distinct, this kind of dichotomy at work here, I think is questionable. For a start, I mean, one thing we could do is argue from example, you have the example of IVF, it's clearly in a sense a manufacturer of life, but it's widely accepted and it's very popular. Um, and it's interesting that those who reject human enhancement altogether tend to also reject IVF. But it's not quite clear whether the distinction between the natural and the artifactual for us is as clear as it was, as it were, uh, was for the ancients. After all, we're very used now to the idea of prosthetic limbs, even uh, artificial organs, as I mentioned, IVF as well. Um, and therefore, I think Habermas's rejection of what he calls the made, as opposed to the grown, as an attack on human dignity, is um, much more difficult uh, to, to get through than uh, seems initially. And I'd add that he doesn't seem that hostile to prosthetic uh, interventions, um, when it comes to therapeutic treatment. Um, I'll come back to the distinction between therapy and enhancement later on. Therapy is when you um, heal an illness, a heal a kind of organic defect. And in those kinds of case, he's rather uh, lenient on the idea of, uh, of uh, genetic intervention. Why so if it's uh, inherently an attack on dignity. Seems to me there's a double standard there which hasn't been recognized. Anyway, let's put that behind us and move on to the third argument. The, th the third argument is from inequality. The argument from inequality um, basically puts forward the view that we will be creating a genetic underclass through 
the project of human enhancement. The program of what's sometimes called liberal eugenics will decrease diversity of looks and capacity. And those who are not, as it were, part of this program, those who are left behind, will be rendered even more disadvantaged than they are already. Um, especially, of course, if genetic enhancement is something you have to pay for. Um, and therefore will be, as it were, um, differentiating between the rich and the poor. Uh, in this area, people talk about the gene rich as opposed to the gene poor. And this, as it were, bifurcation in the population will lead to an undermining of genetic solidarity. Now, the main proponent of this argument is Michael Sandel. He argues that there will be a less chastened and less forgiving meritocracy in virtue of genetic enhancement. Um, and he also worries that um, there'll be terrible effects on uh, particularly females and the disabled because they will be selected for uh, abortion in many cases. Uh, and in many cultures, they will be uh, themselves prime members of the genetic underclass. Look, what, what should we say um, in response to this argument? Um, it's quite morally um, freighted, this argument, but I'm not sure it's got more than rhetorical power. Um, first of all, uh, aborting females and the disabled it's not really, properly speaking, an enhancement. Um, so there's a sort of conceptual slippage going on here, I think. Um, we can deal with the prejudice against girls in certain populations uh, through the law, through moral education. I think we should just reject straightforwardly uh, any use of uh, enhancement technologies to rid the world of females or the disabled as such. Um, uh, any, that is any enhancements that is used in the service of gross inequality should be rejected. Um, again, I would say when it comes to the disabled, we shouldn't infer so quickly from mitigating disability to unjust discrimination against the disabled. Uh, those are two different things. Um, and it's possible to respect a dis disabled person while understanding their disability as problematic, as something that would, in the best of all worlds, be mitigated. And lastly, um, I think that if there are risks in this area, uh, the government and um, its education policy are sufficient to tackle those risks to genetic solidarity, as it's called. Um, and indeed, if um, financially people are, have the wherewithal to access these enhancements, then we will not be in the parlous condition that's uh, suggested. So I want to move on to the fourth argument, the argument from mastery. I think this argument is an outlier as I call it, because it doesn't highlight the effects on the programmed, as Habermas calls them, but rather the, the effects on the programmers, those who are instituting the genetic en enhancements. Um, that is, it affects, as it were, um, the people in charge, those who have mastery in this project. Why so? Well, again, the main proponent here is Sandel. And he institutes a series of contrasts uh, in attitude, as he calls it, or mindset, um, among those who are seeking these enhancements. So he says it, uh, the project constitutes a one-sided triumph of willfulness over giftedness, of dominion over reverence, of molding over beholding, 
The project is one of mastery and hubris, therefore, because it um, partakes in a kind of Promethean impulse, as he calls it, to shut out the unbidden, those things which we don't want to see, uh, the imperfect, as he calls them, the, the imperfect specimen of the human species. His book is called um, uh, Against Perfection or something like that. Um, so this idea of seeking uh, perfection is very dangerous in his view. Uh, and this is echoed by other people like Gilbert Mylander, who argues that there's a kind of hyper agency at work in the genetic enhancement project, which forgets that we are not only creators, but also creatures. And we should respect the fact that we are creatures as well as creators. Well, again, there's a sort of rhetorical power to this view. Um, you can see the kind of contrast that being drawn. I just suggest that they are overdrawn. So it seems to me that we can question whether they are properly contrast at all in some cases. So why do we have to speak of hubris in this context? Why couldn't we speak about heroic effort, perhaps? So there's a problem of persuasive description uh, to begin with. But also, if we take seriously those descriptions, then I think that we can argue that it might be a reflection of reverence to engage in certain genetic enhancements, not as it were, just upending reverence or, or um, denying any reverence for the human. It could, be, it could be a reflection of reverence that we seek to institute certain enhancements. So we should question, as it were, this, whether these contrasts are um, well-founded. And secondly, I think there's a problem in the very form of the argument, because if you read what people who put forward this argument say, they often shade into criticisms, not of a mindset or an attitude, but rather they make purely consequentialist type points. So Sandel says the problem with this um, form of mastery is that it has terrible effects on our appreciation of the imperfect, those who do not conform to our ideals. And Leon Cass says there, are t there will be terrible effects down the line because when people get the enhancement they want, we'll discover that they have become mediocre pleasure seekers, as he calls them. We, the human race will end up being contented cows. Um, so there's, as it were, again, a consequentialist um, type argument here. We'll end up in a bad place. So it's not so much an objection to a mindset as to certain effects. And I think that those effects, as they're identified, are questionable. So there's a lot of uh, empirical support needed for these claims. I mean, is Cass right that we'll all end up mediocre pleasure seekers? Is Sandel right that we'll end up uh, not appreciating the imperfect as it were sidelining them, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, maybe, but we don't have strong empirical evidence for that yet. And I think that therefore we shouldn't preempt this project um, by making blanket condemnations of um, its effects in, in, in this way. At most, we should counsel vigilance um, against the, the risks involved. Okay, so that's the, the fourth argument. Well, I've been at going on for about 25 minutes. So Daniel, how much do I have left? Um, well, we're, we don't mind, but maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, okay, but for speaking? Oh, that's that's okay. Okay. How long okay. would you like to speak for? Yeah, I think 20 minutes should be fine. That's perfect. Okay, great. So this is really, as it were, the argument I think has purchased the argument that we should take seriously, um, the argument from incoherence. And it's not an 
It's not a moral argument. It's a formal argument um, about the very coherence of the project. I want to start by saying that there's a distinction at work in the literature, which is pervasive, but also highly questioned. So there's a strange, um, as it were, feel to a lot of the debate because a distinction is employed which is often um, treated quite skeptically, and that is between therapy and enhancement. What is that distinction? Well, the way it's usually defined is as follows, that therapy, literally from the Greek healing, is a targeted repair of certain organs or organic functions that are found to be diseased or dysfunctional. Whereas enhancement is defined as the purported improvement of human capacities, capacities which are already in a healthy state. So that's, I think, a thumbnail uh, set of uh, definitions for you. Sometimes it's, it's often um, canvassed in a different way. So Michael Sandel will say, there's a contrast between curing people on the one hand, and improving them on the other. Uh, the old way of talking about this was a negative versus positive eugenics. But of course, eugenics has been kicked out of the room because it's had it uh, bad press in the past. So curing versus improving, therapy versus enhancement. Now, I think that although this distinction has been called into question, I think it's a vital one to draw. Um, why so? Well, I think if we don't draw it, we're going to end up metaphysically and morally confused. So the question is why? <clears throat> well, the argument that I'm going to put forward is that if we don't have a grasp of this distinction, we fail to have any grounds for the identification of what a good intervention or a good treatment. Why so? Well, Therapy, the idea of therapy, presupposes that we have a grasp of proper function. That is, we have a grasp of the good toward which an organ or, or an organic function is directed. That is the good which it subserves, you could say. If we have a grasp of proper functioning, we have a grasp of what I want to call the normative profile of an organ or, or an organic function. For example, once we know the function of the eye, that is the eye is uh, meant to see, we have a grasp of what constitutes a good eye and what constitutes a good treatment of an eye as well. It should preserve its capacity to see. That is, we have a kind of teleological understanding of the eye um, it subserves a good. If it doesn't subserve that good, then there's something wrong with it. It's dysfunctional and we should try and repair it. So that, as it were, is implicit in the notion of, of therapy. Likewise, hearing subserves the good of, uh, uh, the ear subserves the good of hearing. If we have an ear which doesn't hear well, we should try and repair it to try and engage in some form of therapy. Now, those are clear cut cases, I think. What happens in the debate is that that model of proper functioning gets lost when we move into the domain of enhancement. What we have in the case of therapy, I want to say, is a well founded and metaphysically robust conception of the normative condition of an organ once we grasp its proper function or functions. Of course, an organ can have more than one function. And once we have that picture of the functioning of a person's organs, we can ascertain the degree to which he or she is in what we might call good working order. 
we can tell that a person who is severely blind and deaf, for instance, is in what we might call, not disparagingly, but purely objectively in bad shape. It would be better if they weren't severely blind and deaf. And that's because we, we have a conception of what it were, would be for them to function properly, and they're not functioning properly. Now, what happens when we move into the domain of enhancement is that we don't have any comparable metaphysical undergirding or matrix for making those kind of judgments. So there's no comparable basis, I want to argue, for judging the normative profile of the person who seeks or is subject, subject to enhancement. That is what we lose a handle on is the proper functioning at which such enhancement is aimed. Oh, uh, the intervention, the enhancing intervention is aimed. What does enhancement afford us? Well, it doesn't afford us the knowledge, I want to say, of what constitutes a good intervention in any um, strictly normative sense. What we're left with in the domain of enhancement is a purely technical construction of enhancement. That is, we can have more of something or less of something, usually more of something or less of something that already obtains. For example, someone who wishes to have, a, say, a vastly increased olfactory capacity or vastly increased powers of hearing, say, to approximate the powers of a bat or something like that, or the or smelling capacity of a dog, um, they want their capacities to be increased along a certain dimension, but whether those uh, whether it's good to increase those capacities is unclear, precisely because we have migrated away from the context, the metaphysical context in which such judgments can be made. That is the grounds for making normative judgments have been abandoned in effect. Um, now, what do we have um, therefore in the case of enhancement? I think what we clearly have is a, um, an idea of what capacities have been increased or augmented but we don't have a conception of whether a person has been improved or not. Um, as it were, that form of judgment, that normative form of judgment uh, has been left behind. And I want to suggest that things are worse uh, still. That is, uh, the argument is um, when we take this notion of enhancement to its logical conclusion, uh, we end up without any, as it were, uh, signposts, without any, um, how can I put it, uh, matrix of uh, decision making at all, because we leave the human behind altogether. The examples I gave above were of um, organic functions that could be increased and in that sense improved. So for instance, increasing one's olfactory acuity, one's uh, auditory acuity, something like that. Now that's taking an extant human capacity and increasing it along a certain dimension. But why should we stick with human capacities at all? After all, I suggested that other species might have uh, better capacities uh, along those dimensions. For instance, dogs can smell more acutely than we can. So why should we stick with our organic species and not look at the capacities of other organic species? Why, in point of fact, should we stick with our um, organic nature at all? Seems to me that there's no fundamental reason why we shouldn't just press beyond all organic functioning and try and institute some kind of non-organic functioning. Um, after all, that could be better 
in this technical sense that I've outlined than organic function, more efficient perhaps. We've seen, you know, in, uh, already we've seen that in prosthetic limbs, which tries to, and to mimic organic functioning, but why stick with a very program of organic functioning at all? So what I want to say is if there's a problem with ma maintaining our grip on normative judgments in the organic domain, a fortiori there's going to be a problem if we press beyond the organic domain altogether. Now we've really moved beyond any metaphysical constraints whatsoever. Uh, the post-human context, the post-organic context, um, is one in which all physical and metaphysical constraints on judging the value of enhancement have been dissolved. I'll quote Leon Cass at this point, someone I tend to agree with in this area. He says that transhumanism therefore can't provide a plausible picture of the new post-human being, and worse, can offer no standards for judging whether this new creature will be better than Homo sapiens. I think Cass is right about that, but I would add um, that it can't offer such standards precisely because it's lost a grip on the metaphysics of human functioning in the first place. So let me uh, wrap up now. Um, I've gone rather speedily over the four initial arguments um, and perhaps um, too speedily as well over the argument from incoherence, the one I think has weight. In sum, my argument's been that the project of human enhancement, when pressed to its logical conclusion, is fundamentally incoherent. It assimilates its own judgments of what it is to be better than well, as Carl Elliott calls it, his book is called Being Better Than Well. Um, it assimilates judgments of what it is to be better than well to judgments of proper functioning. But at the same time, it undermines, I would say, eviscerates the metaphysical foundation of those judgments. And hence it can generate at best a kind of wish list of properties it seeks to change in the human species. And when I say change, I don't mean Im uh, improve in any normative sense, at best increase or um, get more of something or other. So it devolves really into um, a technical project of getting more of this, perhaps less of that, uh, according to certain stipulated goals, usually desires. But those desires can't be assessed normatively because they prescind, I want to say, from human nature altogether. And so they forfeit any constraint on what properties it is good to change. It turns out, therefore, uh, in conclusion, that the project of human enhancement, when pressed to its inevitable conclusion, simply unravels because it's lost its moorings in anything recognizable as the human. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, so we will have a five minute break. Um, I'm gonna set